Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this morning's webcast on troubleshooting Outlook 2013 features. My name is David Sanchez, and I've been with Microsoft for 23 years. I've supported Windows way back when, when the versions were 3.0 and 3.1, as well as Word when it was only Word for DOS, Word 2.0, and air quotes all the way up to Word 7.0. I started on the Outlook team on its first release in 1997, and I've missed only about a year since then when I moved to the Exchange team uh, and then came back uh, in 2003. Today we're going to take a look at uh, a few of the features. Uh, we're going to create a user mailbox as well as a shared mailbox through the Microsoft Online Portal. We'll continue on and explain how to configure Outlook 2013 to connect to the Office 365 mailbox for the first time. Next, we'll take a look at sharing a calendar as well as uh, looking at the manager and delegate scenario. We'll also look at sharing a mailbox and what the common uses are. And we'll also look at uh, sharing just a single folder. Finally, we'll get into some common issues we've seen and how to troubleshoot those issues and the questions to ask in order to scope the issue. Now we've only got about a little less than an hour, so I'm hoping to save some time for Q&A. So let's get started. Creating a mailbox. Creating a mailbox can be performed using the Microsoft Online Portal. Uh, navigating to the Manager Organization Users and Groups area is where this is done. You must have administrative, administrative privileges and you must have an available license for that mailbox. You can also create shared folders in this area as well. So let's take a look and see how that's done. First, uh, we'll sign into the Microsoft Online Portal with our administrative uh, credentials. From here, we can go to any of the Office 365 features, including Outlook Web Access, uh, Word Online, Excel Online, and the like. Uh, but for our purposes, we're going to go to admin, the gray um, tile with the A in the gear cog. This is what we call the uh, admin dashboard. We can perform uh, many administrative functions here. Uh, including managing organization-wide settings, uh, dealing with subscriptions, managing domains, and more. Uh, since we're creating a mailbox, we'll go to users and groups and add users, reset passwords, and more. As you can see, we can add users, mailboxes, uh, contacts, uh, users who may be external, but we may want to see them in the address list. Groups, which are basically distribution lists. And, of course, shared mailboxes. So when we click on users, or that's how it is by the default, we can see the list of our users. Once a user is uh, hovered, uh, a checkbox appears so that we can check it uh, to select that particular user. So as you can see, once we check a user or the checkbox, uh, the options are available for us for that particular mailbox. We can edit, we can delete, reset the password, we can manage email aliases. But for now, we're going to click on the plus sign that's just above the list on the left-hand side. Uh, we'll be asked for minimal details um, to create the mailbox. And really, if you look at it, there are only two required fields the display name and the username. However, it is a good idea to list the first name and the last name just to be complete. So we'll create a new mailbox for Karen Tran. So when you enter the first name and the last name and you pass 
uh, over to the next field, the display name, you'll see that the display name is automatically generated. Uh, you can change this if you want to, to add a middle name or an initial or in the case of somebody getting married, uh, a maiden name. Um, there are additional details. Oh, I forgot we need to do a username. So we'll give her a username. There are additional details that you can fill out, as you can see, job title, department. Um, but for the most part, the main fields that we just uh, filled out are only necessary to create the mailbox. Once we click on Next, we'll be asked if we uh, want to assign administrative privileges to this uh, particular user and a location where this user resides. Um, we're going to choose United States and no administrative uh, issues or, or uh, privileges here. We'll click on Next. This is where we assign the licenses or the license. Uh, and note that you can see how many licenses you have and how many are available. So in this particular case, we have one of 10 licenses of, available. Finally, when we click Next, we are going to, we need to determine where to send the email uh, for this user's logon details, uh, which includes their password. Uh, we can also force a user to change their password uh, through Outlook Web App on the next login, and then we click uh, Create to create the mailbox. At the end, we're um, presented with the username and the password. Uh, again, the password uh, in the previous screen uh, will be mailed to the administrator. And if you wanted to add additional email addresses, we could have added additional email addresses in that box uh, separated by semicolons. Once we click finish, we should see Karen Tran in our list. And there she is. As mentioned, we can also create a shared mailbox from here. When we click on shared mailboxes, we'll see a list of mailboxes. Clicking on the plus sign kicks off the shared mailbox creation process as it did for the users. Now, shared mailbox are a little different in that they don't require a license. We give the mailbox a name and an email address, and when we click next, we'll, we'll be able to add members. We'll give this test 99. I don't think I've done 99 of them, so we don't have any um, conflicts. Click Next, and here's where we can add members. This is a, a members of, of people who will monitor and send email from this shared mailbox. We click the plus sign, and if we click on the um, magnifying glass for search, uh, we'll get our list of users. Uh, and I think we can only select one at a time. Um, so when I select uh, Belinda here, uh, yeah, we can only select one at a time. So we got to add them again and uh, choose the, uh, click the plus sign and then choose the um, magnifying glass again. And then we'll click finish. And we should see test 99 in the uh, list. This actually takes a little bit longer than the users do, and I do want this to finish because I do want to show you uh, one other thing uh, that uh, w another place where we can um, do some administrative tasks, uh, and we might even be able to do a little bit more advanced administrative tax tasks in that area. Uh, it's called the Exchange Control Panel. And it requires us going into Outlook Web App um, and changing the address in the address bar of Internet Explorer uh, to replace OWA, uh, OWA with ECP. Um, as soon as this finishes, I'll do this quickly, and then we'll just browse real quick through it so that, uh, so that you can see it. I'm not quite sure why shared mailboxes take so long 
to create uh, as opposed to the um, the users. It could be that uh, the whole folder hierarchy is going to be created because typically shared mailboxes aren't associated with a username uh, or a user account um, like like regular mailboxes are. Uh, typically your regular mailboxes folder or hierarchies aren't created until you actually log into either Outlook web app or you log into Outlook. That's the time when those uh, the folder hierarchy is created. So if we go to um, uh, Outlook web app, so what we'll do is uh, up in the corner here, we'll go to our tiles and then we'll choose Outlook. And there we are in Outlook web app. Now, if we notice the address bar up at the top of Internet Explorer, it's got OWA there. If we change it to ECP and then hit enter, we're going to come into the exchange control panel. And this is where we can do um, another, it's another dashboard, but uh, it looks to be like we can do more um, advanced options. Uh, we're looking at our mailboxes. Um, we're looking at our groups, um, our resources. Now resources are uh, like rooms, uh, conference rooms uh, and calendars. Uh, we can do our contacts uh, and we can do shared mailboxes. Test 99 should be there and there it is. Uh, as far as resources are concerned, resources I believe are going to need a license. Uh, that's different from the uh, shared mailboxes. And as far as migration is concerned, uh, I think this is going to list all of the users that we've migrated and what the status is. In this case, we haven't migrated any users. Uh, but if we take a look at, let's say, our shared mailbox, let's take a look at, at uh, test 99, and let's do an edit of that. Um, and editing that, we can actually do uh, mailbox delegation, uh, give full access permissions, which we did uh, in, in the portal uh, just a little while ago, and send as permissions. So that's what that did. But it, it, as you can see, we can choose uh, different uh, mailbox usages, uh, apply contact information, organization information, as well as uh, if we go over here to the side, we can convert it to a regular mailbox and we can um, enable or disable in-place archive, in-place hold, and email connectivity. So the Exchange uh, Control uh, Panel or the Exchange Admin Center is uh, a little bit more advanced, um, and I don't know why it's not exposed in the uh, online portal, but that's how we get to it uh, by changing that OWA to ECP. So let's uh, go back to the deck. And now that we've uh, created a, a new folder or a new mailbox, um, we'll go to um, configuring Outlook. So in order to configure Outlook to connect to the Office 365 mailbox, Auto Discover must be working. That's where Outlook gets uh, the bulk of information on how to connect to the mailbox. It also gets a little bit of information from the Active Directory, um, for example, the SMTP address. Um, and then uh, it queries uh, the particular information that you have in that SMTP address to find Auto Discover. Uh, Auto discovers a whole list of addresses for different types of connections, including the Outlook address book, uh, RPC over HTTP settings, uh, and more. Um, unlike an on-premise deployment, uh, typical deployments utilizing a PRF file, um, they won't work. Uh, Office 365 and, and even Exchange 2013 use a unique GUID to determine the mailbox, and the PRF files require a static server name uh, to connect. Uh, you have better luck using a PRF with Exchange 2013 in the uh, on-premise environment, 
but in the Office 365, uh, you don't know what a server name is, so um, we have to we have to rely on Auto Discover to uh, give us that information. Um, users can typically go through the profile creation wizard. Um, this uses what we call auto configure, and, and that's getting the SMTP address from Active Directory and Auto Discover. There are no prompts for configuration information to the user, uh, possibly a password or possibly a profile name. Uh, there is a feature uh, called Zero Config Exchange, uh, and it's a registry setting that will bypass the profile creation wizard and may ask the user for a profile name um, and their password. Uh, but for now, we're going to take a look at the most common method, the profile creation wither, uh, wizard. Uh, Zero Config Exchange does require additional registry settings that don't fall within the scope or time frame of this webcast. So let's let's check out uh, configuring Outlook for our first use of the Office 365 mailbox. So now that that's lit up, we're going to we're going to minimize our um, online portal here and we're going to go to a client. Now this client is uh, Jannie Fox. She's logged into her machine at, uh, at work and um, she is with Fabricam 4.info. She just received a new machine and therefore there are no Outlook profiles configured. We'll take a look at that. No Outlook profiles configured. I created a shortcut to the mail applet in control panel uh, in case you were wondering about that, uh, this mail applet. I just right clicked and chose uh, create shortcut. Automatically does it to the desktop. So what we'll do is we'll start Outlook and this will kick off the profile creation wizard. So let's see uh, what Jannie will see. So she gets a welcome. And she clicks on next, and then do you want to uh, set up Outlook to connect an email account? And the obvious answer would be yes. So we click on next. Again, this is the simplest case scenario. As you can see, the SMTP address has already been brought forth. This is an active, active directory. Um, there are no exchange servers in this environment, so uh, this, the, this was actually placed in active directory. Next, well next uh, we click on next, and this is when we'll go out uh, based on her SMTP address. We'll look in the cloud for active uh, for uh, auto discover information. Uh, this can take several minutes. Um, hopefully, uh, we will. It won't take that long. Uh, as I've mentioned, this is the simplest case scenario. Uh, using PRFs for the on-premise deployments and zero config exchange, um, those are deployment tools. Uh, new profiles um, will typically have to be created. Uh, let's let's ask if she's been prompted for a password, and then we'll click on OK. And if she remembers her credentials, if we click Remember My Credentials, she won't be prompted again, or shouldn't be prompted again. Um, maybe I did not. Oh, I uh, it was the wrong username. Um, let's see here. Uh, Fabricam 4.info. That is a demo problem, uh, not a problem that you'll see there. The username was different because she is in a different domain. Uh, our wizard will tell us, put check marks, tell us we're good to go. And when we click on finish, Outlook will start with uh, um, uh, and setting up her mailbox for the first time. Again, as I mentioned, the simplest case scenario. Um, the PRFs and the zero config exchange, as I was mentioning, are deployment tools. Um, new profiles typically have to be created, and those methods will uh, generally require Outlook to be con configured in a first run um, 
scenario so that it can use its first run process to import the PRF values that need to be added or to uh, create a new profile automatically with zero config exchange. So it's a little more complicated as there are registry settings that need to be created and set uh, typically through a login script. So um, again, too large a scope for this webcast. Um, but uh, as you can see, um, Jenny is up and running um, with Outlook 2013. Uh, about the only thing that she was really prompted for was her password. So a fairly painless situation or a very painless situation um, for, um, for the user. So next, let's go uh, to uh, sharing a calendar. The most common calendar sharing scenario is that of a manager and a delegate. Uh, the manager is the owner of the calendar and the delegate has certain permissions and rights uh, to access and manage the manager's calendar for him or her. Uh, this includes meeting requests, attached requests, uh, a special permission uh, to send on behalf of the manager, and a special rule that sends meeting related items to the delegate uh, if it's configured as such and whether or not it's going to send copies to the manager. Um, a manager delegate scenario requires constant communication and diligence between the manager and the delegates or delegates with respect to who will act upon a meeting items. Um, Outlook's come a long way from where meeting items fall off of the calendar because uh, both parties acted on the meeting requests or just one party acted on it and the other deleted the meeting request from the inbox, um, that action actually resulted in removal of the item from the, from the calendar. Uh, that action being um, deleting the meeting request from the inbox without taking action on it. The fully supported way of implementing the manager and delegate relationship is through the Outlook UI. Uh, and in just a bit, we'll take a look at that setting. Other uses for sharing the calendar uh, are, like I've mentioned before, for conference rooms. Um, these are now generally created as, as rooms or resource mailboxes, and they can be created from the Exchange Control Panel, as we saw. These uh, mailboxes are special in that they can be assigned uh, a special auto-accept function so that uh, when you're trying to book a room, if the time slot is clear, then it's automatically accepted. Uh, other functions can be configured, such as uh, decline recurring appointments or, or decline situations where there is a conflict, where maybe the time slot is taken uh, and we went ahead and tried to, to book the room anyway. Uh, typical permissions to these types of folders uh, are as reviewer, uh, where the user can only see what time slots are open and cannot modify any existing items. Also, uh, another uh, method of sharing is one user may want to share their calendar with another user. Uh, this is done in the Outlook UI, and we'll take a quick look at that too. And finally, there's a generic folder sharing um, feature. It's pretty much the same as sharing a calendar, uh, but with other types of folders such as emails or contacts or tasks. And while we look at the, at the single calendar sharing, uh, we'll also look at... Um, the other types of uh, folders as well. So let's take a look at that real quick. Okay, so for the manager delegate settings, we assign uh, this through the Outlook UI by going to File, Account Settings, and Delegate Access. From there, we get the, um, the Delegates dialog box. Now, uh, Jenny already has Belinda Hines in there uh, as a uh, delegate. So we'll just add another delegate. Uh, you, can have, uh, you can have many delegates, um, but the um, 
the old adage here, uh, less is best, uh, applies. Um, and I'll explain later. Uh, so we click on add. And when we click on add, we can choose that person from the address list, any person that we want to be the delegate. Uh, so let's, uh, let's choose, um, oh, let's choose Karen, uh, since Karen was newly created. So Karen is going to be a uh, delegate for Jannie. Now, the delegate permissions tab uh, or dialog box comes up. Uh, by default, um, the following is, is, is selected. Uh, the calendar is set with editor permissions where they can recreate and modify all kinds of items, even their own or those that aren't their own, and the task folder as well. Um, the delegate receives copies of meeting related messages sent to me is also checked. That's uh, the one in, right there in the middle here. Um, we can uh, we can bump up the permissions if we want to. Um, we can give it to author and actually we can't. We're the only editor here. I beg your pardon. Uh, what we can do is add uh, all the way up to editor to the other folders such as inbox, contacts, and notes. Uh, we can also choose to automatically send a message to the delegate summarizing these permissions. And if we have items that we've marked as private, um, there's a private option in the meeting, in the meeting or uh, appointment items. If we have that selected, we can choose whether or not our delegate can see those private items. So once we click OK, we'll see Karen in the list. So. Once we're back in this dialog box, now we need to decide uh, who receives meeting related items and how. Um, the recommended is a top option and uh, that option is basically to send the meeting request to the delegate, but send a copy to me. Um, the delegate will get an actionable meeting request uh, where, which will have um, the accept tentative and decline buttons fully visible and exposed. While the manager will receive, as a copy, it will be an informational meeting request. Uh, this meeting request doesn't expose the accept tentative or decline buttons, but rather informs the manager that no action is needed because this has been sent to your delegate uh, and your, your delegate is going to act upon it. Uh, or it may even tell him no action is necessary. Your delegate accepted this on February 24, 2015. Um, this is to help defray any confusion between the two parties and possibly resulting in the loss of the meeting. The manager can still act upon the meeting, uh, but he needs to open the meeting and dropping down the respond option to expose the accept tentative and decline buttons. Uh, and furthermore, in the case of both parties taking conflicting action, uh, the last responder will win. So if the delegate declines the meeting, it will be removed from the calendar. But if the manager accepts it, it will go back on the calendar and vice versa. If the delegate uh, accepts it and the manager declines it, it will be removed from the calendar since the last last action was done by the manager. The other choices are my delegates only. And in that case, uh, the manager will not see meeting related items in the inbox. Um, and the other one is my delegates and me. And the difference between the top option and the last option is that the manager doesn't get an informational with the, uh, the bottom option um, uh, with the hidden response buttons. It gets a true meeting request with those buttons fully and obviously exposed. Now, Jenny here has some, so, so I'll show you exactly what I mean. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, speaking of delegates, the term less is better can't be emphasized enough with respect to the manager-delegate relationship. The more delegates that you have accessing your calendar, the more users who have uh, access to the calendar, the higher chances of mistakes happening. And it's hard enough already with iPhones, iPods, iPads, Androids, and Windows phones, phones, phones uh, not to mention OWA and add-ins and, and who knows what else, accessing the calendar with right privileges. So uh, the term, again, less is better with respect to delegates is uh, rings true here. 
So uh, I'll take a look. Uh, we'll go ahead and let me dismiss or, or click OK here uh, if it will do it. There it goes. It's going to. Now this will take a this sometimes takes a little while if you as you can see Outlook's trying to receive data from the Exchange server uh, out there uh, on the cloud uh, and uh, it's also setting up those special permissions uh, sent on behalf of and it's also setting up uh, that that special rule that's actually hidden in the mailbox that allows the you the uh, the delegate to receive the meeting requests. It's not a rule that you can see in the manage rules and alerts um, folder there. Once we get that done, um, we can take a look at uh, sharing the, uh, the calendar and some of the meeting requests that I was speaking about. Um, I should have just clicked cancel here because it didn't really matter, but um, uh, maybe um, I don't think I can now. I'm going to actually set it in a non-responding state. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get there. Um, so I'll continue with, uh, with uh, lecture. Um, sharing a calendar or any other folder is pretty straightforward. Uh, you pretty much right-click on the folder and you choose properties, and then you select the permissions tab. Uh, in the permissions tab, you typically have two entries in the list, default and anonymous. Uh, default is where you can set a permission, and that permission is granted for everyone. Um, anonymous is used for internal access, and it should always be left alone. Um, but you can also add users and apply specific permissions to those users. Uh, for example, your default could be to um, allow only, only users to see free busy, while your colleague for your colleague, it could be sent to reviewer or editor or whatever um, type of permission you want to give them, uh, where they can see the details of your items, except for private items. Uh, I think the delegate is the only one that can see private items. Um, and when you drop down that permissions level and, and you choose each one, you can see the options below, below them changing so that you can see what permission uh, allows them to do. That finally finished, so let's go back over here to, um, um, let's just look at a, a calendar folder. Um, there are a lot of options, a lot of features in Outlook that require you to look at a folder list. Folder list is um, done by going down to the bottom, going to the ellipse, and choosing folders. And right now, we're only looking at mail-enabled items. Notice we don't see tasks or we don't see calendars, okay, or contacts. There's just simply mail-enabled items. If we click on calendar, it'll only be calendar items. If we click on people, it will be contact items. Tasks, it'll be task items. Uh, we're going to click on folders here, and we can see all of our folders, um, including one called sync issues, which we'll get to uh, a little bit later on. Uh, if we right-click on the calendar or any other folder, go to Properties and go to the Permissions, here are the, um, inf here are the um, permissions that are set. Now, for, for Janny here, the default is free busy time, and we see that Belinda Hines has editor and Karen, Karen Tran has editor, and that's because they're delegates. Uh, but we can, in fact, add and maybe put um, uh, Devin in there and we can we can give him um, oh we can give him let's say contributor uh, in which case he'll be set as custom uh, but if we take a look at free busy time it'll tell us or the different permissions it'll tell us what what the, the user can do so if we start off with reviewer uh, they get full details but they can't delete anything they can't write anything the only thing is visible is the folder, and as we get uh, more uh, apply more permissions, uh, non-editing author. Now that they can create items, but they can only delete their own, uh, all the way up to publishing editor, where they can create items, create subfolders, they can edit all of them, and they can delete all of them as well. Uh, so those apply also to not just calendar items, but uh, calendar folders, but also any other kind of folder, be it a mail folder or a um, 
a contacts folder or a tasks folder. So let's take a look at, uh, go back to the slide and take a look at um, the next section. which is going to be sharing a mailbox. So uh, sharing a mailbox is uh, sharing an entire mailbox is typically used in a manager delegate scenario where the manager is completely hands off, uh, doesn't want to touch anything at all, doesn't want to touch his email. Uh, for some reason, uh, but uh, doesn't want to have to act on anything, any task, any calendar items, any, any meeting requests. Uh, this typically entails giving full mailbox access permissions as well as send as permissions. And the difference between send on behalf of and send as is that the uh, former will show sent by Janny on behalf of Johnny while send as will show that it was sent by Johnny, even though uh, Janny actually sent it. Um, other uses are for specific workflow processes that require, say, a help desk personnel to answer emails or meetings from the inbox and access other folders to perform specific tasks. Um, so, you know, it depends on, on, you know, whether you really need the full mailbox to be shared, depends on that workflow. So let's get into troubleshooting. So there are two or three types of calendar sharing issues that can be experienced at one time or another. And in order to fully understand the issues, we need to ask some very specific questions because I'm missing calendar items is really too broad and vague and it needs to be put in the correct context. Uh, for example, uh, was it on the calendar now uh, and you no longer see it on the calendar? Mm, that can indicate that some process, uh, maybe even Outlook, could have removed the item for some reason. Uh, another question is, can you switch to a list view and see the item? Um, if so, this can indicate a damaged property that isn't allowing Outlook to render the item in the graphical day, week, and month view. Um, so the item is actually not missing, but it is corrupt in some way. Uh, is it on the delegate's copy of the manager's calendar, but not on the manager's own calendar? And this can indicate that there are some sort of sync issues at play, or, and, and sync issues usually are network issues uh, or network uh, uh, glitches that happen every once in a while. Uh, in this particular case, when, when you ask the question, O is your friend here? Uh, so if you open up O of the manager's calendar, um, we, is that item on there that the, that the delegate uh, created? And, and if it is, then that means the delegate successfully synced up to the calendar, uh, and the manager may be having problems syncing down, syncing it to his local calendar, the OST. If it's not on the calendar, then it's the delegate who isn't able to sync this data up on the server. And, and of course, if it's not on the server, then the manager's not going to get it. So as you can see, this, these questions help to narrow down where we're going to go with uh, the specific troubleshooting. Um, receiving duplicate calendar items. Um, well, who has access to the calendar? and What has access to the calendar? Um, you know, when I say what has access to the calendar, we're talking about all those devices and, and uh, possibly other uh, machines that may be running from home that we left Outlook running on. Um, uh, with respect to some of, the, um, um, some of the devices, the mobile devices, uh, there may be issues uh, in, with that particular a mobile device. We have a KBO article and it's in the resources page of this deck uh, of uh, known issues of uh, active sync and other third party um, uh, items. But those last two questions, who has access to the calendar and what has access, uh, that can be asked for most issues, the, most of the issues. Uh, there are a myriad of processes touching that Outlook calendar, like I've mentioned before, from mobile devices to OWA, to third-party applications or add-ins. And with respect to add-ins, um, they can do the harm all the while running under the Outlook context so it looks like Outlook did it. So there are special 
uh, things that we need to do to uh, to try to narrow that down. Uh, for the most part, we really can't tell why something happened after the fact. But we have to be ready for it to occur again. And this entails maybe turning on logging on the, on the clients for everyone and everything that has access to the calendar. Uh, remember, less is better. Uh, the less the less the delegates, the less the devices, um, that will, should ring true. Um, logging on the server for on-premise users, um, engaging third-party vendors at the start is always a best practice uh, if they're involved. One thing to remember is that calendar issues are not simple issues with simple quick fixes or explanations. With so many processes touching the calendar, coupled with uh, the intermittency of some of these issues, it can be a long and tedious bout of troubleshooting. Let's move on to shared folders. Oh, I advanced it. Um, so with shared folders, uh, issues that revolve around synchronization issues uh, and, and that can include the calendar as well as we've mentioned with, you know, is it on one calendar, not the other. Uh, some of the same questions need to be asked, and for the most part, we see where items on a shared folder are simply not syncing with the person accessing that shared folder. Um, more often than not, what we see here is users are hitting an exchange server limit. Uh, we in support, we call these 9646 issues because uh, when they arise, an event 9646 is logged in the application log of the exchange server. For on-premise users, these are easy to see, but for Office 365 users, we typically can't see the application log of the server. Uh, but still, for both environments, uh, a sync issue message is sent to your sync issues folder, um, and the sync issues folder, as I showed earlier, is, is available only for Cashmo clients, and again, you have to be viewing the folder list to see it. Uh, that sync issue message will have an error, something to the effect of your server administrator has limited the amount of items that you can open. This typically indicates that uh, the shared mailbox, um, and even if you're just accessing one folder, um, the whole mailbox has more than 500 folders in it. Uh, or it can be a cumulative count of over 500 folders for each shared folder or shared mailbox you're opening. Uh, so checking the number of folders with a uh, get dash mailbox folder statistic command is helpful. Um, that's done through the PowerShell. Um, there are workarounds for the folder limit, uh, such as not caching shared folders or using uh, multi-X for that shared mailbox. Uh, Multi-X is... Uh, involves applying full permissions to the mailbox and then adding that mailbox as an account in the account list under file, account settings, account settings. Um, this workaround works because accounts don't have to open every folder like, like a shared access does. Uh, folders are, aren't the only items that have limits. Uh, sessions have a limit of 32 and those are the other most common items but it could be messages, it could be folder views and others. But for the most part, we typically see folders and sessions. Uh, sessions are a little harder to find and typically involve issues with a network, uh, network issues where Outlook is constantly being con disconnected and reconnected and disconnected and reconnected. Uh, we see this a lot with firewalls or other type of, of WAN appliances. Um, when Outlook gets disconnected, the other side uh, the the WAN uh, appliance holds on to that session to exchange, and um, and even though it's not a, a good active session, um, when Outlook gets reconnected, it establishes another connection, so another four or so sessions are created to exchange, and the broken connections connections can stay till its uh, total time to live expires. Um, there are also add-ins or applications, MAPI applications that may be sending emails out um, on behalf of somebody can uh, also exhaust the sessions pool. And that, that's a 32 session uh, limit. Again, the resources page here 
uh, lists um, the most common issues and, and explains what needs to be done to help troubleshoot them. I uh, encourage you to take a look at them and read them. Um, uh, the first one, the top one, troubleshooting missing duplicate items, it, it is long and detailed, uh, but it'll give you an idea of what is needed in order to find out exactly what uh, what the issue is or have the best chance of finding out what the issue is. Um, the second one is the current issues with Microsoft Exchange Active Seat and third-party devices. We've all got devices in our environment. Check it out. Uh, it's a good article and, and it's, a, it's a living, breathing article. It, it's constantly changing, update, and being updated. Uh, performance problems when you try access folders in a secondary mailbox and Outlook, those are dealing with the 9646 type, the folder, 500 folder limit, um, or the 32 session limit. Um, and again, an event 9646 occurs when you, when a service account opens many MAPI sessions on an exchange service server. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, network issues as I described uh, earlier. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time today, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks again. Goodbye.